My guest today is an innovative software developer and a popularizer of science. He began studying chemistry, but his career took a very different path when he was offered the chance to join in the creation of a groundbreaking computational software program called Mathematica. He's co-founder of Wolfram Research and Touch Press. He's also a prominent element collector and best-selling author. I'm pleased to welcome to Illinois Pioneers Urbana's own Teo Gray. Delighted to be Thank here. you very much for being here and bringing some cool stuff for us to talk about. A at some point, we will talk about some of the examples from your element collection that you brought along. I did not even know that element collecting was actually a hobby. Well, neither did I when I got started. And uh, since becoming, you know, sort of known on the web as an element collector, I've gotten, you know, quite a few emails from people who said, you know, 30, 40 years ago when they were a kid, they started collecting elements. Mm -hmm. And now I'm now getting an even larger number from people who are saying they've started taking up element collecting now as a hobby. Do you have any idea, does anyone have any idea how many element collectors there are? I don't know, I think it's at least half a dozen, but you know, probably, probably thousands who are doing it you know, a little bit at a time. It turns out it's actually quite difficult, uh, both you know, to find them all and then also, you kind of have to know enough chemistry about each of the different elements to know how to even store it. You know, it's not like, like mineral collecting, rock collecting, that's a great hobby because you put them on a shelf and they're all there. But there's a lot of elements. They're gases, they're radioactive, you know, they're liquid, they're, they're reactive. They're potentially they're toxic, toxic, hazardous, yeah. uh, and, and It's so sort of a more technical hobby than, than, yeah. than crystal rock collecting. Well, I want to back up a little bit from there and talk a little bit about your uh, growing up, at least uh, uh, in, in, in this respect. Your parents, both your parents were math professors at the University of Illinois. So I want to know is, what's it like growing up with two mathematicians for parents? Well, yeah, people wonder. Uh, I mean, I think probably reasonably normal. I don't know. I suppose there's a lot of people in this town who grew up with, you know, one or two professors as parents. Um, but so, yeah, it does uh, kind of, people raise eyebrows a little bit. When you were a toddler, were they uh, trying to teach you the calculus or anything like that? Uh, no, they were quite good about that, actually. Did they actually work with you, try to help you with your math, math homework? professors are absolutely useless for math homework. <laughs> because, you know, people think math, you know, math professor, whatever, math professors don't do anything that looks at all like what you would recognize as, you know, high school math. You know, it's, it's far more abstract and complicated and, mm -hmm. you know, talking about sets and symmetries and things and not x squared, you know, plus seven. So did that disappoint you that you could not go to them and say, Dad, Mom, can you help me with this? And they said, no. I, I like, can't. my kids are not particularly interested in help with their chemistry homework either. I think it's kind of a, you know, a parent thing. Yeah. Well, I did. I, I think I saw in an interview you were talking about the, the fact, and I think that it's true that that kids tend not to think what their parents do is very interesting, and that maybe your kids weren't all that interested in chemistry. So maybe yeah. that's why you you were doing something other than what your parents did. Yeah, but I mean, kids, whatever your parents do, it's obviously dorky and uninteresting. I mean, and I, that was really driven home one day. I was filming with a new high school <laughs> sodium explosions out at my farm. So I was, you know, dropping reactive chemicals into water. They blow up. There's these tremendous explosions. And, and I told my son, you know, I'm going to go out and blow up some sodium. And he's like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> he would not even get off the couch to come outside to see sodium explosions, which I think are some of the coolest forms mm -hmm. of explosion around. So at what point in your childhood did you start to get interested in chemistry? Um, I think one of the problems I had growing up was that I had a really, really good chemistry teacher, like a fabulously good chemistry teacher, so good that he managed to convince me that I was interested in chemistry. And I, it took me four years of undergraduate school and a year of graduate school before I realized that I'm actually not that interested in being a chemist. You know, what, mm -hmm. what a, what, you know, being a professor of chemistry would have not been a happy outcome for me. Um, because you know, I enjoy chemistry for all the sorts of things that you don't get to do if you're a serious professor of chemistry. I like playing around with this stuff, not really, you know, researching it. And I just, I, I think it would not have made a good professor. So you you did your undergraduate at the U of I in chemistry, and then you went to Berkeley, to the University of California, Berkeley, to yeah. start on PhD in chemistry. Yeah. And it's it's. We can talk about how you got involved with Mathematica, but from what you were saying before, it made it sound like it just, you really didn't take too long before you realized that just wasn't what you wanted to do. No, I think what I realized was that um, what I was really good at in a sort of professional capacity was computer stuff, 
was software. And that's what I had been doing on the side the whole time. You know, I was messing around at the Play-Doh lab, you know, all through high school and, you know, writing programs and teaching myself programming. Uh, and that was actually what, from a vocational point of view, I was really good at. Uh, and, you know, the opportunity came after my first year at Berkeley. I came back here and I thought I'll spend a summer working with Stephen Wolfram and, you know, he has this new thing that didn't have a name at the time and it sounded interesting and, you know, he, he actually called me up at, when I was at Berkeley and said, you know, would you want to work on this? And I said, whatever, sure, I've got nothing to do for the summer. Um, and I came back and I literally forgot to tell Berkeley that I wasn't coming back as a student the next year because by the end of the summer it was so clear that like this is what I should be doing mm -hmm. and it, there was so much to do and I was so busy and you know, like a year later they sent me a letter saying your student insurance has been canceled and you're not a student here anymore and I was like yeah, whatever because I'm busy. Um, Were your parents disappointed you didn't become a college professor? I don't know. Uh, so when I won this thing called the Ig Nobel Prize, I don't know if you're familiar with that. Yes. It's, it's this joke prize that's put out by the, the uh, what is it, the Journal for Irreproducible Results. Um, I gave a little acceptance speech holding up this set of chattering teeth, which is the Ig Nobel Award, uh, and said this is the closest thing to academic distinction that they're going to get out of me. <laughs> um, Poor mom uh, and dad. But I, I think they're reasonably satisfied on the whole. Mm -hmm. How did you meet uh, Stephen Wolfram? Uh, well, he, he called me up, like I said. So I'd written a program that was being used at the math department uh, for teaching linear programming or something like that. It was just a little, little Macintosh program that did, had a little sort of teaching component to it. Uh, and I guess he saw that or somebody saw that and, and, and he called me up and you know, we discussed what needed to be done and I said, that sounded interesting and I've got nothing better to do for the summer. Um, and of course, you you became involved in the development of what would become Mathematica. Right. Never bet, went back to Berkeley no. and got on a path where maybe you sh maybe you should have been on. Yeah, I before. don't know. I mean, it's hard to say. I think having a grounding in hard science as opposed to uh, you know computer science. I've never taken any classes in computer science. I have no professional qualifications whatsoever to write software, uh, which is actually characteristic of a lot of the best people. Uh, in the software business is that they do this, I, I think if it's something like more like, um, you know, stonemasonry or woodworking or something, it's like, it's a craft skill. It's not an academic, uh, it's not something you can really teach in schools. Mm -hmm. It's like you have to feel the machine as it were and, and it just has to be something that you, you sort of click with. And if it is, then that's what you should be doing in your life because it's in high demand and if you're good at it, you ought to be doing it. That, I, uh, although it, I, I guess it amazed me. I, I was struck by the fact that that you have had so much su success in this area, and yet you never formally studied software design. No, and like I say, a, a lot of the best programmers never do. Um, which isn't to say that there isn't a value in a computer science education. There, are, you know, people who have a PhD in computer science, they have, you know, a very specific set of knowledge about. Uh, you know, certain kinds of algorithms and, and you know, ways in which things can be done sort of at a higher level. Um, you know, I don't know, maybe it's kind of like, um, you know, a coach versus the players on the team. Right? Sort of a, you know, the, the coach has to understand the theory or, or a, you know, a choreographer versus the dancers. So it's now been 25 years, I think. More or less, years, roughly, 25 yeah. years roughly since Mathematica was introduced. Well, in fact, we just had, in July, we had our 25th was a 20 anniversary party. So, yeah. so and, and here it's, a, what I can, about all I can say is that this is, it's software that's used by scientists and engineers to do computation, statistical work, visualization, it does a wide range of things. Now, that's about as much as, as I know about Mathematica. What, just beyond that, a little bit beyond that, is important to know about what Mathematica is. Well, so we've had various different taglines over the years to try to describe and encapsulate in one sentence what Mathematica does. Uh, the one that we've never used and the one that I've always thought was most descriptive is that it's a system for doing things for which there is no system for doing. Uh, in other words, if you have a problem uh, that involves needing to, you know, do some kind of computation, but computation can be defined very broadly you need to kind of manipulate something, get something to work in a certain way, and there is no software that does that for you. Like, you can't buy a package that will, that will do what you want. You need to have a flexible, powerful environment with a language in it where you can express your problem 
and then kind of bring tools to bear on solving it. And that's, that's the thing that Mathematica is kind of uniquely among, you know, all the things in the world it's uniquely good at is solving these sorts of problems that are a new class of problem, you know, a different kind of problem that, that people haven't encountered before. Now, the, and the, the part that you designed, it's what's called the front end, that's, that's the user interface. The user interface, yeah. it's, the, it's the way that the person tells, says, this is what I want to do, right? So, mm -hmm. talk, talk about that and how you went about doing that. Well, it's, it was sort of an iterative process. Um, I mean, Mathematica at its heart is a language. It's a programming language, a computer language. Mm -hmm. uh, although, you know, a very unusual one with a, with a, a lot of um, things going for it as a language. But basically what you do is you type in stuff um, with a certain syntax. And then you say, you know, here's my statement. I would like this worked on, please. And it might be, you know, here's a polynomial I want it expanded, or here's a function I'd like it graphed, or you know, here's a very, you know, here's hundreds of lines of code that, that describe an algorithm. Run this algorithm for me. So the basic operation is you type something in, and then you say go, you know, compute this, and it gives you an answer back. So that gives you a natural sort of in-out sequence, um, and. You know, beyond that, there's a tremendous amount of elaboration, obviously, 25 years worth of, uh, so far, of developments and refinements in how exactly one goes about doing that. And, and who uses Mathematica? Well, um, because it's so good at solving new, different, unique problems, it tends to attract, you know, I'm like, who are the people who solve technical, you know, scientific, computational, mathematical sorts of problems? Well, a lot of professors, mm -hmm. um, a lot of researchers, uh, at, at you know private companies where, that have research labs, uh, government agencies that have research operations, um, the NSA is a big customer. Um, uh, you know basically the places where kind of the envelope is being pushed forward uh, tend to have a high concentration of Mathematica users, as compared to professions where the problems to be solved are more or less settled. Because as soon as there's you know thousands of people who all need to solve a certain problem in the same way uh, over and over again, there tends to be a you know, specialized piece of software that gets developed and, uh, and then they, they use that. You know, just to, to talk a little bit about, about more about Wolfram, that, that is the company, um, I think that we're lucky to have it here in Champaign-Urbana because it's one of those things that you, you might think, well, Wolfram Research would be in Silicon Valley because it's a software company. And, and I'm sure that people do ask, they ask Stephen Wolfram, maybe they ask you, so why are you guys here? Yeah, well, I, there's a couple of reasons. I, one thing was, of course, that Stephen Wolfram was at the U of I as a professor at the time that the company was founded. Uh, you know, early on, the first couple of years, we, we kept thinking, well, you know, I guess we better move now. Uh, you know, once we reached a, you know, each sort of different threshold of size, we thought, well, you know, move to Chicago because it's a bigger city. Or we actually looked at office space in Silicon Valley thinking, well, we're a software company. We kind of ought to be in Silicon Valley. And every time we did that, we looked at, well, let's see, the rent would be five times higher and we'd have to pay everybody twice as much and they would all have hour-long commutes. And do any of us want to do this? Like, why, why would we want to do this? when we have this beautiful little company in a beautiful little town, um, lots of really smart people around, lots of graduates from the university in all kinds of different fields. Um, you know, just, it's just like, why would we want to move to Silicon Valley? And every time I go to Silicon Valley, I think, boy, am I glad that I don't live here. It's a great place to visit, but you know, uh, this, is, this is a wonderful place to be in many ways. And uh, you know, I think the internet uh, which kind of was coming along, uh, didn't really exist when we started, but it came along pretty quick, has made it much more realistic for companies like ours to be, you know, pretty much wherever they want to be. Because from a, the point of view of communication and, you know, being in the middle of what's happening in the world, it doesn't matter where you are physically. For those who maybe uh, don't remember their high school chemistry or weren't paying attention, things they should have known if they were had been paying attention. What is an element? Well, so uh, the, the simplest indivisible kind of substance, I guess. I mean, basically it's defined as 
you know, a substance where all the atoms in it have the same number of protons in them, which is the atomic number. So if you've got a whole bunch of stuff and all the atoms in it all have six protons, that's carbon. You know, if they've all got, I don't know, 22 protons, that's titanium. Um, and you know you can then of course combine them in, in uh, endless numbers of different ways, uh, but it's a substance which is all you know made of the same kind of atoms, and therefore no matter how much you subdivide it, no matter how much you try to separate it out, it will always be the same stuff. You know you can't divide it into two different kinds of substances like you can with compounds. So here we have some uh, just a, a few examples of some things that you brought from your collection, maybe. We should talk about. Sure. Well, I, sort of, sort of, I mentioned number 22, which is titanium, because that's kind of my theme for today. I brought you uh, a bunch of different titanium objects. Um, sometimes people ask me what my favorite element is, and I say I don't have a favorite child either. <laughs> um, but titanium is pretty cool. So, uh, um, well, why? Why is titanium well, cool? Well, because of all the things you can make out of it. So, like this one, if you look in my book, um, this is the big sample that represents titanium or on the, the various posters that I've got. Um, so you just, just pick it up. I and mean, that is just a, a satisfying object, solid Well, it's certainly titanium. solid. It has a beautiful um, patina, titanium does. Yeah, it's, and it never rusts. It's completely mm -hmm. impervious. Um, and it's beautiful finish. And just, just think of how that thing must have been made. And this is this was was this machined from a this solid machined, block? Well, I don't know if it's, it may it may have been cast into oh, the rough okay, shape and then cast. but then definitely machined afterwards. And what what is uh, this? What is the purpose of this? this thing? It's called a blisk, which is uh, a contraction of bladed impeller disc, and it's basically uh, it's from a very small jet engine, and it's it, you know it's it's on the shaft of the of a, the, the sort of the core that spins in a jet engine and it's basically compressing. It's in the, the intake stage, so it's, it spins and it compresses air down into the combustion chamber. Mm -hmm. I have another one, actually, of the same thing, uh, which is That's this. <laughs> a little bit, a little bigger. Oh, it's a little heavier, too. So this is one blade. Um, you can see, the, the, again, the beautiful curvature, solid titanium, and this is from a relatively small uh, commercial jet airplane. Again, it's it's the first stage of the intake intake stage. So if you're if you're looking towards the front of a plane or you know at the front of a plane and mm -hmm. you see the jet engine, there's this giant you know thing, and inside of that there's what looks like a fan with a lot of blades. Right. This is one That's of those blades, is. and th this is a smaller one. So those engines are are huge things if you're up mm -hmm. close to them, and you imagine that thing spinning at you know thousands of RPM. And you imagine there's thousands, well, not thousands, but there's hundreds of them in every jet engine of all different sizes. As, as it goes through the engine, they come in different stages and they go to different alloys. And if any one of those were to break while you're flying, you know, hundreds of people are going to die. So the stakes are very high in the quality control of manufacturing of these things. So I think this is, this I think gives an example of what it is you have tried to do, I think, with with website and book, with iPad app, as a way of getting people excited about the elements, not just as some sort of abstract thing, like you could give them, show them a lump of something. Although this is that one's pretty much has no is, point. It's just a, it's just a pretty lump. Yeah. Is pretty nice. That is just a pretty lump. This is bismuth. Is bismuth. Um, but I think what you're what you're trying to do is get people acquainted with the role these things play in our lives. What, what they're used for, and yeah, it's a way of getting people they, excited about them. They're all. I, I don't know if I see. What I when I wrote this book, it was kind of just because I felt like I've got all these pictures, and you know, having collected all this stuff, I've accumulated a lot of, you know, what I think of as interesting anecdotes, and I thought mm -hmm. I should kind of put these down on a, you know, in a book because they're interesting to me. Uh, and I really had absolutely no agenda in terms of educating the world, or uh, nor did I have any particular audience in mind, uh, other than just this is stuff that I think is interesting. Mm -hmm. And one of the, what really surprised me, I suppose we should probably hold up the book here. Um, what's really surprised me about this book is the number of kids that I get email from, like eight-year-olds or ten-year-olds. That seems to be who reads it. Um, which I found quite surprising because I was not writing, 
you know, it's not like I tried to dumb down the language or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems like, you know, somehow whatever I find curious and interesting appeals to that age range, possibly because of my own inability to grow up or, or whatever. You, you start, as part of your interest, we talked about the periodic table table, but that you also, I know, were looking for examples of elements. They were being photographed. You had a website which people can still see, which I think is very cool. If you go to periodictable.com, yep. you can see an example of this. This leads to the book. First this, posters. Posters first, this, then okay. card decks, so, then oh, book. Posters, card decks, book. But I really want to make sure we talk about the iPad app, because this gives us an opportunity to talk about something else that you're really interested in, and that is electronic books. Yeah. Yeah, well, so once, I mean, basically there's this, you know, first I built a table because I misunderstood this book. Uh -huh. Then I had to go on eBay and buy thousands of element samples to put, you know. And I figured if I don't take pictures of these things and write some kind of description about each one, you know, I'm going to forget what it is. I'm going to lose track. So I better photograph them all. Um, for some reason, and I don't really know why, I decided that I wanted to experiment with rotational photography, where we, we, I put the thing on a turntable with a camera and photograph it from all angles. Mm -hmm. um, so I did that, and I actually ended up uh, uh, hiring this guy, Nick Mann, who deserves a lot of credit for the photographs in this book, um, and basically set him to the task of going through these samples one by one and photographing them all on a turntable rig. So you know, when you look at this book uh, and you look at the pictures in it, Basically, every single one of these pictures is actually one out of a set of 360 photos that we took of that object. It's, it's just one sample. And it's very frustrating in that print book not to be able to show things from all sides. And even before the iPad was announced, I was kind of thinking, you know, I wish there was a medium. I wish there was a device where we could make an edition of that book where people could spin those objects. Like you could take your finger and you could make it turn because that would be really cool. But there wasn't any, you know, there wasn't any sort of distribution channel or place where you could make a thing like that and, and make some kind of money on it to make up for the huge amount of work that would take. So that's it. so that was what happened that made the leap into that possible was essentially uh, not trying to pump up Apple's profits. They're doing quite well. But the fact that we have the app store so the place to get the app, yeah. we have the iPad, so we have the thing to, to run the app on. Uh, so having the platform, having the hardware, having the distribution suddenly makes it feasible that you actually do something like yeah, this. Yeah, exactly. When the iPad was announced, I was like, thank you, Steve Jobs, for once again coming down and giving us this device that we didn't know we needed and that we can't live without because it is the perfect it was just like it was the exact thing that I needed uh, in order to realize that, you know, I was like, I have this book, all the text is written, it's just been published. It was published just a few months before the iPad was announced. I've got all these photographs that I've taken all around that have no use in paper, but mm -hmm. they would be perfect for this iPad. And it was, just, it was a very compelling moment. And Apple conveniently, they announced the iPad, and when they announced it, they said, we're going to ship this in about two months. Uh, so there was two months right there where everything was in place. And there were, there, there were simulators. There was the, the whole software development environment existed already for iPhones and iPod Touch. Basically, the iPad is just a big iPod Touch. So in terms of being able to develop something, everything was there. I called up my colleague, Max Whitby, uh, who's based in London. He's a, a, an ex-BBC film producer and, and media expert, interactive media. And I said, look, let's just, like, tell our families that we'll see them again in two months and drop everything and do this app because this is so clearly the right thing to do. But one of the area I want to try and spend at least a few minutes talking about is has to do with your what seems to be your interest in getting people, particularly I think young people, interested in science. Uh, so tell me about how it is you came to do the, the book Mad Science Experiments You Can Do at Home but Probably Shouldn't. Right. Well, actually, you know, I've never felt any missionary zeal to advance the cause of science education. Whatever. I sort of, you know, I do this stuff because I think it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if other people think it's fascinating too, great, that's fine with me. And if it gets ki kids interested in science, I have no problem with that. That's fine too. But it's, you know. That's not if, your 
purpose. It's not why I'm doing it. I mean, uh, you know, if I wanted to sound sanctimonious, I would say, yes, I'm doing all of this for the good of mankind. <laughs> but actually, I'm doing it because I think it's cool to blow stuff up um, <laughs> and get paid to write about it. And, you know, that's honestly why I'm doing it. And, and, and I think that probably has something to do with why, you know, it's, it ends up being interesting to other people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't do stuff because I think it'd be good for the youth of America that they should have this. And when you do that, it usually comes out kind of unsatisfactory. I, we're at the point where I'm, I'm sorry to say that we're going to have to, to wrap up. I think that you said, perhaps it was before we started, that maybe you, you're spending less time at Wolfram or doing that kind of work than you are with the kinds of things here we've been talking about with producing the kind of interactive books like The Elements. Uh, so you've had the chance to do a, a lot of different things. Where do you see yourself going now? Where... No, it's very hard to say. I mean, one of the beautiful things about being in the interactive book business is that Mathematica is an incredibly useful tool in that business. It's kind of one of the secret sauces that we have mm -hmm. uh, in, in developing our product. So it's nice to see, you know, I spent 22 or 23 years developing this software, and I've now kind of pivoted to the other side. And, you know, when I see things in Mathematica, uh, it's like, I hate that, and it's my fault. Uh, you know, I, I did that. Uh, and, you know, who knows, maybe I'll swing around sometime and, and go back and fix those things or, yeah. or whatever, but I don't know. It's so, well, what, what though keeps you going? I mean, what really engages you? I think, you know, doing new and different things is, is good. Uh, and, and I enjoy doing things that other people appreciate. You know, it's probably shallow, but it's, it's really nice when, you know, the book sells well. Not just because they give me money, but because I feel like I'm having some kind of you know, effect on people, or otherwise they wouldn't keep buying it. Mm. Well, there, I think we're going to have to stop. I wish we could continue, but we'll have to call a halt. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. It's with. delightful. And to you, thanks for watching, and we hope that you'll join us again next time for another edition of Illinois Pioneers.